have you with us and have this joint event. Nice. nice to meet you too. Thank you. Great. So 30 seconds and we start. Is everyone yes. here? Okay. Lucas, oh, is... Ivan, o Vitor, meu, o Vitor que trabalha comigo vai entrar mais tarde só, tá? Então eu vou apresentar, não se preocupe, tá? E Pedro Miguel, Vitor. É, o Vitor. Oh, tá. Lucas, tudo bem, só Pedro? Uma, uma pergunta é. antes de iniciar o pro nosso compartilhamento de PowerPoint, eu acho que não está habilitado ainda, se o pessoal da organização vai habilitando um a um. Uh... Certo. É, normalmente eles vão habilitando conforme ah. as apresentações vão sendo feitas. Ótimo. O meu está habilitado. Tá. Ótimo. É, eu peço para o pessoal do suporte aí verificar essa questão da habilitação, porque é, tanto o Marcos quanto a Marina vou, vão apresentar. apresentar. A Vera também vai apresentar. Também. Então Isso, todos têm que estar habilitados eles, aí. A gente libera para eles quando eles vão compartilhar, só. Bom? Ok, perfeito. Okay. É porque a primeira apresentação é, vai ser exatamente do Marcos. Tá? Não sei se é o Marcos ou a Marina que vão é, é o compartilhar. Eu é o Marcos. Então, pois, então ele, ele vai ser o primeiro a apresentar. Em seguida vai vir o Wesley e depois a Vera com o trabalho dela com o Vitor. Ok? Should I, should I also say, uh, should I also uh, speak, speak right now or should I speak later? The beginning, yes. I'll give you the floor just after a, a brief inter introduction. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, okay. You tell me when I, when it's my turn. Thank you, sorry. Okay, great. So, all right, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening for some of you. And we're live on YouTube. It's a pleasure to have you with us and for this event of the International Department of IPEA, together with WTHS program in Fundação Getúlio Vargas, on a very special uh, issue that here in IPEA we started to, to uh, a new project to deal with that, to, to, to go into the specifics of the impacts of the mega regional agreements on Brazil. And we ended up uh, ch checking with, with Vera and some other colleagues that uh, there were some other projects going on. So we decided to sum things up and have this joint event in order to present some of the results that we had IPEA in the FGV, being part of this WTO chess program. Uh, and, but also uh, with very, very special guests in this uh, opening uh, session that are uh, Lucas Ferraz and Pedro Miguel. So two key uh, policy makers uh, on, on trade policy in Brazil. And it's a pleasure to have you again, Lucas and Pedro, with us. Just a, a very quick introduction, and I'll give the floor to, to Werner for, for his uh, uh, also uh, introductory uh, words. Uh, well, the idea on, on how the mega regionals would affect trade governance is there for some time now. Now, I myself being someone who who's a specialist or claims to be a specialist on trade issues or trade policy issues. I've been discussing that for some time, but I, 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 do, see, I do see that uh, we, we, we have arrived to, to a place where we, we start to see those effects in, in, in how the, the, the world economy has changed in the last couple of years. It's very important to, let's say, to understand that. For some time we were, uh, discussing in, in, in it is the, the creation of the WTO itself, the idea of regionalism versus multilateralism, how regional, regionalism threatens or under, under, underpins or is it part or a building block for a multilateral system or not? Where, what are the, 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 the issues that, that should be taken into account for policymakers in order to, to deal with, with those two different worlds? Uh, it was there for some since the, since the, 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 the beginning of the WTO, and even the, in the GATT system. Let's remember that it was there already uh, with the customs unions and things like that. So, uh, but obviously now we, what we do see with the changes that uh, are, let's say, being accelerated, especially in this in this pandemic period, I'd say, is that. Uh, some of the issues that started to be clear maybe five to seven years ago 
are now in place and we do see quite clearly some of the uh, uh, results of the the great uh, three factories of the world as Baldwin usually usually said when talking about uh, global value chains and things like that and how uh, those uh, movements in the production of goods and services in the world do affect the way we're going to regulate trade we're going to put rules on the table so that trade can exist uh, and that what brings us to this event at the end of the day so the changes are very quick and what's good to to know from a Brazilian perspective is that uh, we are in a moment of change when it comes to, uh, to, to trade policy in Brazil and that's very good Otherwise, maybe it would be even worse uh, uh, than we used to see when, uh, the kind of uh, uh, closed economy and, and let's say trade policy being just at the margins of any kind of economic policy in the country. But we are in a, in a moment of change and some of the guys that are here with us today are, are the guys that are doing those changes, that are in the front doing those changes so I do see Brazil a lot more, let's say, prepared, ready to be a, a, a relevant player that it might be uh, when it comes to trade governance in this world. But obviously, we're not as big as we should be when it comes to international trade, but we are a big economy, and an economy that is trying to open up, to modernize itself, to go to a new level of, of development with uh, uh, increasing productivity and and, and, and well-being of, of, our, of our citizens. So uh, trade policy, I'd say, started to be, at this point in time in Brazil, an important tool of economic policy. And we've been seeing many changes when it comes to in instruments and, and specific uh, policies uh, regarding trade and investment at large. Uh, so what is good to see is that I do see Brazil a lot more prepared, but what we uh, as a think tank, as a, within the, the Minister of Economy, but having this broad uh, perspective and also uh, many other clients in different ministries here, we pay um, together with Fundação Getúlio Vargas, what we try to do is put, shed some light on, on the issues where we can really shed some light. Obviously, there are many, many complex issues that are uh, taken into account when one uh, starts to understand and, and analyze the mega regionals and the, how they can affect uh, Brazil itself, but also the international trade governance at large. And we're going to be able to, uh, together with the uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas and the WTO Chess program today, to give uh, a hint or at least a quick uh, uh, overview on, on some of the results of this year-long projects that we have at IPEA and FGV. FGV. So uh, welcome you all, and please, Werner uh, Zwak, Director of the WTO Chess Program, the floor is yours. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to participate as the Director of the Knowledge Management Division, which, as you know, now runs the Chess Program together with an experienced team. Uh, following the footsteps of Mark Mart uh, Martin Smets and others who have founded the, the program. And I want to firstly thank Vera for what she has done it was together with the research team. I've been introduced today to more uh, of your team, more professors. But I'm thinking back last year, around a year ago, when you first proposed this idea together with the chair from, from Argentina, together with uh, Valentina Delic, um, how you designed this progress, the, the project, how you selected the mega regionals, also those that Brazil and the EU participate in. It's a special honor uh, that we have the presence of the Ministry of, Minister of Economics, Lucas Ferraz, and also Secretary for Regional Bilateral Negotiations, uh, Pedro Miguel de Costa and all the professors that are participating today and I've introduced, been introduced and I've seen in what a collegial way and uh, with how much uh, enthusiasm and motivation you're pursuing this project. As you know, the CHAIRS program is there to support and promote uh, trade-related academic activities with policy relevance in developing and the least developed countries. 
The Brazilian chair has been really very strong in this context. I remember when DG Azevedo came here, one of the first things he told me that he went through the hands of the uh, Brazilian chair being trained on trade remedies and on many other matters. And I think uh, the Brazilian chairs for many years has been very closely related also with the personal relations with uh, Gasveras, uh, with the policymakers, with the government, with the Rio Branco Institute, with the training for the uh, diplomats that joined Geneva. And I'm also looking back to the time when Vera was here and uh, made the mission here in Geneva, a research hub, uh, like in University Institute. We're grateful that with the support of the Netherlands, we could uh, fund these projects, a dozen of which have been uh, materializing this year. Um, I've seen that you are linking it with policymakers, with academics, with business, with non-governmental organizations. And the research project on mega regional trade agreements is, I think, very topical. It has significant implications for trade policymakers in the region and beyond, particularly for developing countries emerging economies. Understanding mega regional trade agreements and their legal provisions is crucial for the, for the future of multilateral trade negotiations with the increasing fragmentation on trade rule making and the deep crisis surrounding the multilateral system we're facing here in Geneva, getting research and scientific evidence on the cost of being isolated from such regional mega regionals or being a member and beneficiary of me mega regionals is significant, not only in relations to trade flows, but also in relation to economic growth. And our DG, uh, Dr. Ngozi, she constantly stresses the need for evidence-based uh, basis and advice to policymakers and to negotiators, because she thinks that's the way you get into compromise mode and get something done. The regional trade liberalization, as we know, can support long-term multilateral liberalization if regional agreements are truly market opening and contain harmonized components that are apt to become precursors to for creating new and deepening existing multilateral agreements when negotiated in accordance with the pertinent principles in the WTO agreements like Article 24 of the GATT and Article 5 of the GATT. These mega regional trade agreements can support free trade and the multilateral trading system in the longer run and contribute to the world's economic recovery amid the COVID-19 crisis and pandemic and to build better resilience in, the, uh, in response to future crises and also being a lab laboratory for testing new provisions in regionals that in the multilateral system are difficult to agree on. And we have seen with some of the mega reg uh, regionals that you are researching, like the, the RCIP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, but also that is the biggest in terms of economic output, but also the uh, CT CPTT, which was saved after President Trump uh, abandoned it. The C CPTPP has been negotiated and has been also a laboratory and a breeding room for provisions that would otherwise in the multilateral system not yet be possible. For example, when you think of competition law or procurement and investment liberalization, and the same may also have, hold true for RCEP and for the mega regionals that the European Union has concluded with other uh, international, with other regions in the world, including Mercosur. So all these uh, projects are very topical. They are very important at the current juncture. And it's why, that's why it's so important that the Brazilian chair is uh, analyzing this. And I find it particularly noteworthy that the GTAP model has been used to conduct economic impact analysis on the emergent countries like Brazil, but also in other regions of the world with Argentina and maybe other chairs in Russia or India, South Africa, to the extent they can participate. There's little doubt that the trading system has changed fundamentally over the past years with the rising uh, emerging economies of which Brazil is one. Um, these countries perceive risks and opportunities of these mega regionals and act upon them. And this will likely influence the future architecture of the whole world trading system, because as I mentioned, test provisions and approaches are tested that could become the precursors for what the WTO can achieve later on. 
Emerging country, countries are expected to shoulder more responsibilities and play a more important role in shaping the future architecture and the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that disrupted trade and supply chains also uh, necessitates testing new provisions and new grounds in putting in place, uh, overcoming the trade restrictive measures that have been put in place in recent months and one and a half years. Therefore, understanding the limitations of existing trade agreements and preparing policy guidance on how to respond to the post-pandemic recovery in the least trade restrictive manner is one of the most important tasks, important tasks not only for Latin America, for the mega regions in other areas, spanning other areas of the world, and for the WTO in Geneva. It's a special honor and it's very important for us from the CHAIRS program to support this highly topical research to better understand the impacts of mega trade agreements on emerging countries in the region and across regions. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the outcomes of this workshop and the, your project that is ongoing for a year now to being published in renowned journals, to being conceptualized as trade policy recommendations and background materials, not only for the Brazilian government and the Brazilian missionary in Geneva, but also beyond in the context of GRULAC and uh, developing countries and as a stepping stone for uh, multilateral organizations. I wish you all um, great luck and I would like to thank you for all the motivation, the work you've already conducted so far. And thanks again to the ministers and to the professors and to Vera, Vera in particular. Thank you. Thanks, Werner. Lucas Ferraz, the floor is your Secretary of Foreign Trade. Thank you, Ivan. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I, was, I was not expecting uh, to make my opening remarks in English. Uh, I assure you I prepared a very beautiful text in Portuguese. But uh, anyway, I will try to convey the main message of my text uh, in English, of course. So again, uh, thank you, Ivan, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to attend the seminars uh, uh, promoted by IPEA. Uh, uh, I'd like also to, to, to say hello and to greet Vera, uh, Fernando Ribeiro, uh, uh, Cicero, and of course, Werner Zuc, uh, the, the, the coordinator of the chair program uh, at the WTO. Uh, great pleasure to be here, very important topic, and I would like to make a few comments on this regarding the Brazilian trade, the current Brazilian trade policy. As you all know, uh, Brazil has been a very protectionist economy over the last decades, and I think this reality started to change uh, in 2019 when we took office uh, when the, 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 the new government, Jair Bolsonaro government, started in the beginning of 2019. Um, over the last three decades, we had more than 300 agreements formalized in the scope of the WTO. And over the same period, the only significant agreement that Brazil has formalized was Mercosur in 1991. As I said, I think this reality started to change in 2019, when we finally concluded the negotiations with the European Union. Uh, the Mercosur-European Union agreement is among the, fifth, the five largest trade agreements in the world and is by far the largest agreement formalized by Brazilian authorities so far. We also formalized the agreement, we also concluded the negotiations with EFTA countries. We uh, also we started the accession process of Brazil uh, to the GPA, the Government Procure Procurement Agreement at the WTO, a very significant agreement that will open a potential market for Brazilian exports of nearly $1.7 trillion per year. Uh, and we also, and we, all, and we have been also negotiating uh, significant agreements like the one with Canada, South Korea, and, and Singapore. Uh, regarding the impact analysis of those agreements, the ones that we have concluded 
and also the ones that we have been negotiating, uh, we estimate the gains, you know, from this big portfolio of agreements of nearly uh, $300 billion for the coming uh, 20 years, in 20 years, for, for 2040. I mean, the, the cumulative gains for GDP. In terms of our, uh, 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 in terms of exports, exports and imports, we estimate a cumulative gain uh, of nearly $600 billion. And for investments, a cumulative gain of the order of $180 billion, uh, cumulative gains until 2040. Uh, I say this because it's a lot, you know, it's significant. And I think it's uh, it's uh, it's a change, you know, at least in the direction of the Brazilian trade policy uh, uh, so far. Brazil is still a closed economy, but I think this is, this reality has been is starting to change gradually uh, with transparency, you know, with, and with a, a a constant dialogue with the Brazilian private sector. Uh, I also take this opportunity to say that. Regarding transparency, uh, for the first time we have been, you know, publicizing all the impact analysis of all the agreements negotiated by the Brazilian economy and also under negotiations. You can find all the impact analysis for those agreements uh, in the government uh, website. Um, I would also like to say that, in spite of the fact that we have been, you know, changing the course. Uh, we believe we have been changing the course of the Brazilian trade policy, not only in terms of, you know, tariff issues, but also regarding non-tariff issues. Uh, we believe, we from the Ministry of Economy, we strongly believe that Mercosul needs reforms, needs reforms. And I say this at least regarding two pillars, uh, the flexibilization of the negotiations for the Mercosul countries, and also the reform of our common external tariff. We believe that we need more flexibilization in terms of negotiations, mainly because we cannot spend, you know, more to any years to negotiate a significant trade agreement as the one we have negotiated with the European Union. We need to close the gap, you know, between Brazil and the more developed economies. We need to uh, 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 improve, you know, our business environment. We need to trade more, and we need, you know, in the end, uh, to increase the productive gains of the Brazilian economy in order to increase our long run, you know, GDP growth rates. Um, we need more flexibility. Uh, we need. We support the idea of, you know, flexible, you know, uh, frameworks in terms of negotiations, like the one we have. Currently, with South Korea, where Argentina, you know, do not negotiate the no, the role package, you know, in terms of uh, 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 accession of goods, uh, uh, market accession, of, uh, and also rules of origin. You know, so are the two topics. Uh, the external policy, you know, the trade policy, the Brazilian trade policy. I think it's very is very clear. You know, we have. Nowadays in the world, basically three big factories. The one that we have in North America, you know, with the United States as the big supplier of technology. The one that we have in the European Union with Germany as the big, you know, high tech supplier. And the one that we have in Asia with China and Japan as the big uh, uh, tech, high tech supplier. I say this because. The focus of our trade policy is to negotiate new trade, significant and new trade agreements with the so called natural trade partners. The United States is the second uh, uh, largest trade partner for, the, for Brazil. China is the first one. And the European Union, as, 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 uh, uh, as, a, as a group, is also the second larger. Uh, 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 largest Brazilian trade partner after China. We have concluded the negotiations with the European Union. Uh, we would like to have a more ambitious approach regarding the United States. We don't feel the United States is now ready to start uh, FTA talks with Brazil, ambitious FTA talks with Brazil. But anyway, we managed to close a very important non-tariff barrier protocol last year 
with the United States, and we believe that could be a springboard for something more ambitious in the coming future. Regarding Asia, we have been negotiating with South Korea, as I said, with Singapore, and also we, are, we have some preliminary trade talks with Indonesia and Vietnam, and we plan, we plan to start negotiating these agreements uh, uh, very soon. This is our strategy to Asia, uh, the, the political economy of, negotiate, of negotiating with Asian economies is not easy at all. It's very complicated, mainly because of the trade partner pa pattern that we have with the region. I would say this is a very Ricardian trade pattern. We have basically export commodities to the region and we import manufactured products, but we need to be creative you know, we need to engage, get engaged in the region. And I, as I said, those agreements, we believe they would be, they will be a springboard to a more ambitious approach in the future regarding the mega regions that we have in the region, like the RCEP and even the CPTPP. Uh, and last, for some brief comments regarding the exercise that we are going to discuss today, uh, Vera and his uh, team has uh, have calculated, have estimated the costs of staying out of those mega regionals in the Asian, in the Asian, Asian region, region, specifically RCEP and CPTPP. Uh, my comments would be uh, uh, the following. First of all, uh, I would say that the costs, Vera, are perhaps much higher than the one that you have estimated because uh, um, much more than just calculating or estimating the cost of staying out of those agreements, we need also to take into consideration the opportunity cost of not being, you know, of not joining this agreement in the future. And if you add the cost of staying out with the, the cost of not uh, joining those agreements in the future, we can, we can come to numbers much, you know, higher than the ones that uh, you have calculated. But anyway, I think the work was very, you know, important. It's, it conveys, you know, a very important message, you know, to Brazilian uh, uh, policymakers. And I can say that we are very much aware of those costs and we are working hard and have been working hard with our colleagues from other ministries. We have here Ambassador Pedro Miguel. Uh, we have been working very hard, you know, in order to get engaged in order to join you know, agreements in, the, in, this, in, this, in this region in the future. Uh, but of course, we need to prepare you know, our economy. We need to, to, to let's say, to advance uh, uh, the reforms that we have been undertaking in our economy in order to get prepared for a more ambitious approach in the future. Uh, I, also to, uh, uh, I would also like to call your attention to the fact that uh, uh, Brazil has already uh, three trade agreements with at least two economies uh, from the CTPP uh, 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 agreement, Peru and Chile. So it's not true, it's written in the text that Brazil has no agreements with the economies from uh, uh, both uh, uh, mega regions, but Brazil has already an agreement with Peru and Chile and is of course negotiating with Canada, Singapore uh, and South Korea, which are of course economies that are uh, from each one of those two mega regions, belonging to those two mega regions. Um, I would also like to say that perhaps uh, in, in the case, just a brief comment regarding the modeling, modeling issues. Uh, I, I read that you guys also considered, you know, in the policy scenario, not only the CTPP and, 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 and the RCEP, but also the agreements that the European Union have formalized, you know, with other economies. And I would say that perhaps in order to have, you know, a, a better appraisal of the real impacts uh, on the Brazilian economy in the future, we should also consider in the baseline scenario, the agreements that Brazil has already concluded, like the one with the European Union and the one with the EFTA countries, and perhaps the GPA, if it's possible, you know, in spite of all the difficulties that we have to find good data in order to simulate the impact of the government procurement, procurement agreement on the Brazilian economy. Uh, and then, uh, last but not least, just, a, just a, 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 the last question, Professor Vera, 
uh, are you really sure that the United States would like to come back to the to the, to the, to the TPP? You know, it's a uh, you 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 made this hypothesis. It's there. You consider the United States, you know, in the in the in the agreement. But to tell you the truth, frankly speaking, I don't see you know any sign so far that the United States would like to come back, you know, to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Even though I would say that would be great news for the global economy and 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 also for Brazil in the coming future, since we are planning to have a more ambitious approach to the region uh, as soon as we get prepared. So that would be my my comments. Again, I, I thank you very much for the opportunity, you know, to, to, to discuss such a very important issue, you know, regarding our trade policy and to also uh, uh, to publicize a little bit more our achievements so far, you know, in, during these three years in, in, in the government. And we are, of course, planning to do more. We still have one year ahead and I'm sure I will be here again to say, to give you some more good news regarding our trade policy in the future. So thank you very much again, and I, I wish you a very good debate today. Thank you, Ivan. Many thanks, Lucas. Ambassador Pedro Miguel da Costa Silva, Secretary of Regional and Bilateral Negotiations in the Americas, and the Chief Negotiator from Tamaraty. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ivan, and uh, good afternoon to all participants in this event uh, with a special hello to the members of this opening panel, the director, Werner Duke, and my colleague, uh, Secretary of Foreign Trade, uh, Lucas Ferreira from the Ministry of Economy. And I also would like to say hello to the other panelists. I would like to thank IPEA for the opportunity of sharing the point of view of the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in this very interesting, complex, and timely discussion. I have recently benefited from a preview of the study made by Professor Vera Tortensen about the impact of the mega regionals on Brazil and on other emerging economies. Her presentation emphasized not only the implications related to trade diversion and market share loss, but also the cost of opportunity of being absent from the construction of the new regulatory arrangements established by these agreements while still being uh, subject to the systemic changes they bring. From there, I could draw three main conclusions. The first one is that Brazil has to open up its economy and diversify its trade partners, since countries that are less integrated into the global value chains might uh, become increasingly unable to cope with the new trends and rules in international trade. Uh, the second one is that Brazil has to negotiate ambitious and comprehensive agreements and try to bring its own interest to the ongoing process of deep regulation through bilateral and regional agreements. And in third place, Brazil has to maintain its efforts to renew and reform the WTO as a way to reestablish its role as the main rule-setting body for international trade, strengthen its role of monitoring and ensuring transparency in the implementation of new trade agreements, provide a forum for dispute settlement and stimulate the discussion of issues of concern for developing countries that are not always properly addressed in regional uh, agreements. The good news uh, that I bring here today is that I believe that Brazil is fully engaged in all three strategies, and I think that Lucas has already mentioned uh, some of these. Diversifying its trade partners and becoming more integrated to the global economy, negotiating regional trade agreements and being part of the designing of new trade rules and at the same time encouraging the renovation of the multilateral trading system. First, an intense agenda of trade negotiations is underway. Mercosur is negotiating FTAs with Canada, the Republic of Korea, Singapore and Lebanon. We have also been discussing the expansion of agreements already in force with Israel, India and Egypt. We have proposed trade agreements to Central American countries. As Lucas mentioned, we're in the concluding stages of preparatory studies to launch negotiations with Indonesia and Vietnam. And we are always looking for new potential trade agreements with partners such as Japan, Great Britain, or the Eurasian Economic Union, to name a few. 
Of course, uh, moving forward in these different negotiations depends on a complicated equation that varies case by case. In some instances, we have to forge consensus within Mercosur. In others, for prospective partners need to be ready to engage, which is not always the case. As you all know, in 2019, Mercosur was able to conclude negotiations of comprehensive agreements with the EU and EFTA. Yeah. Lucas has mentioned already the, 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 the impact of the Mercosur-EU agreement, which can be considered a mega agreement by any aspect and accounts for a higher GDP than CPTPP, for example. And these agreements are milestones in Mercosur's trade policy by covering not only trading goods, but also trading services, investments, and government procurement. Mercosur also goes beyond its commitments within the scope of the WTO and has been including in its agreements provisions on sustainable development, small and medium enterprises, and cooperation. The list of potential partners previously uh, mentioned shows very clear that, clearly that we have been prospecting new trade agreements with countries in different continents and with different levels of development. Some of them are key players in the mega regional trade agreements. We understand that the diversification of partners with different profiles can generate incentives for a greater number of economic sectors, leveraging the benefits of a broad network of trade agreements. We also consider that by negotiating on a building block basis with a selected number of strategic partners, Brazil and its Mercosur associates will be better prepared if we ever decide to join another mega agreement. In terms of the negotiating dynamics, the process of joining a mega agreement seems more beneficial to a candidate who already has a network of bilateral agreements with most of its members. The gap to overcome in terms of opening markets and adjusting to new sets of rules will be much smaller. And instead of a fixed menu, you can start with a a la carte approach. Uh, Lucas has already mentioned this also, but among the signatories of the CPTPP, Mercosur already has free trade agreements with Chile and Peru, with uh, which Brazil is also deepening its trade commitments. Uh, the South American bloc, as already mentioned, is currently negotiating with Canada and Singapore. And we have bilateral agreements or negoti ongoing negotiations with Mexico. We have recently concluded an exploratory dialogue with Vietnam. As stated before, Mercosur is interested in a free trade agreement with Japan and maintains contacts with Australia and New Zealand through the trade dialogue mechanism established with these countries. Finally, a word about the WTO. I believe that nobody can deny the efforts that Brazil has made in order to contribute to the strengthening of the three pillars of the organization to make sure that it remains relevant, useful, and protects the achievements that we have made collectively as members. In summary, we in Itamarachi believe it is necessary to expand Mercosur's network of trade agreements, and we have been taking steps in this direction. And we are certainly aware of the importance of the mega regional trade deals. However, at this stage, we believe that through bilateral or bi-regional negotiations, we could start from a more balanced ground and therefore have a broader margin for negotiation than in an accession to an already closed package. At the same time, we have to make the necessary studies and preparations to be ready for the challenges that we will face. Before I conclude, I think it is that it is important to mention the other trend that we are witnessing today. Apart from the mega trade deals, we see a trend against trade agreements and towards autarky and self-reliance. A trend towards unilateral trade measures supposedly concerned with leveling the playing field. A trend towards administered trade through VERs, VRAs, and other such creatures of the past. A trend towards using trade agreements as instruments to exert pressure on issues that have nothing to do with trade. It is difficult to say which trend will, pre will prevail or whether both will coexist in a complicated dynamic. What is certain is that Brazil and its Mercosur partners have to be fully aware of the challenges and step up to the plate. Thank you.
Thanks, Pedro. Excellent. So with that, we close this opening session. Let me thank Pedro, Lucas, and Werner for being with us. If you can stay for some time, please do stay with us. And I give the floor to my colleague, Fernando Ribeiro, who coordinates the trade uh, studies area and agenda that is, is quite strong at IPEA. Fernando, the floor is yours, please. Now you, you manage. Thank you very much, Ivan. Good afternoon, good evening for everybody, especially for the WTO officials that are accompanying this event. And I'm very pleased to coordinate this round table uh, to discuss the NEB agreements and their impacts. And today uh, we will have three papers presented. Two of them were made by visiting researchers of IPEA, and one from uh, Getulio Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo. Uh, the two papers made in IPEA will be soon published in IPEA's Bulletin for International Political Economy uh, uh, that has been published, uh, uh, periodic that has been published since 2010 at every four months uh, by the International Economic and Political Studies Department. Um, as the bulletin will only be available by the end of the year, uh, IPEA is providing uh, these two studies as preliminary publications, and they can be soon assessed in the following days uh, at IPEA's internet portal. Uh, the first paper that's authored by, by Marcos Mauer de Salles and Marina Eugenio de Carvalho uh, is dedicated to make a compar comparative analysis of the regulatory framework of three of the most important recent agreements, namely the CPTPP, uh, the RCEP, Comprehensive Regional Economic Partnership, and also the Africa Continental, Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, and they are working for some months uh, in this theme, and it's also a work in progress. And the authors will bring us a preliminary analysis of the structure of each agreement and the main regulatory features. Uh, the second paper of IPEA, uh, made by Wesley Faria and Admir Detarelli Jr., aims to assess the economic impacts of Brazilian economy, on Brazilian economy, of these three mega regional trade agreements using G GTAP model. Uh, the third paper made something similar, uh, also uh, using GTAP, uh, an assessment of the impact of the regional trade agreement, but with different features. Uh, the paper was carried by Vitor Vieira and Vera Torstensen, researchers of the Tullio Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo, and this paper was made with the support of WTO GR's CHAIRS program. Uh, the paper is also devoted to analyze the impacts with DTAP, but they consider the impacts not only in Brazil, but also Argentina, Russia, India, and South Africa, uh, uh, what they call Barista. Uh, and their simulations consider two different scenarios. Uh, the T TPP-12, including the United States, jointly with the European Union, plus four countries, Canada, Singapore, Vietnam, and Japan, that has free trade agreements with the European Union. Uh, another with the RCEP and EU uh, EU plus four, of plus these four uh, countries, and also a third with TPP-12, RCEP, NU, plus the four countries. Uh, and so they try to assess the cost of being isolated from this MEG agreement. And this uh, paper that will be published uh, soon as a discussion paper of the Tulu Vargas Foundation. Uh, I think that should be very interesting to see, and especially to compare the results of both both papers uh, of modeling use JETA because they they consider very different hypotheses as and as we will see 
the results are different, but they go in the same direction and they leave basically the same message, uh, especially for Brazil. Uh, and it's important also to discuss the trade regulation because we think that these mega agreements will, uh, in some sense, uh, change and affect highly the international debate on trade regulation in some crucial matters, special technical barriers, rules of origin, investment, e-commerce, environmental issues, and so on. And so uh, I will now pass the floor to the first presentation by Marcus Mauer and Marina Egidio. You can go on. Um, uh, here, can you can you hear me? Hello? Yes. yes. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon uh, to all. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation. And my name and my in name of Marina uh, for this um, uh, interesting uh, uh, joint event that is being promoted by IPEA. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ivan Oliveira for the invitation. Uh, Fernando Ribeiro for the organization of the event and coordinating our project, and to acknowledge and thank the presence of the authorities from WTO, uh, from the uh, from the Secretary of Foreign Trade, uh, Secretary Lupe Ferraz, and from Itamaraty, Ambassador Pedro Miguel. I'd like to thank uh, for your presence, and also for all the uh, invited uh, guests and speakers uh, that uh, join us today. Um, our project, uh, as uh, Fernando has already uh, um, uh, pointed, highlighted some of the uh, aspects. So we will uh, today try to uh, center our presentation, uh, Marina and myself, uh, in three parts. Uh, uh, broadly um, uh, present uh, the project uh, that has uh, began uh, um, um, roughly six months ago. Uh, then comment on some of the, the, prelim uh, the preliminary results that we achieved so far. Uh, then uh, Marina will carry on with the presentation and then at the end we will conclude with some elements that are under debate for further analysis by our project. We would like to share them with you uh, and uh, we'll really appreciate your comments and your feedback uh, on uh, the the path uh, that this project is is heading. Um, we um, basically um, the main objective uh, of this uh, project is to understand this phenomenon of the of new the, of the new generation of mega trade agreements and their impacts on Brazil in terms of foreign trade and foreign investments, uh, emphasizing that uh, what well. Uh, our main uh, scope is to uh, realize a, a comparative analysis of the regulatory frameworks of the three of these most recent texts, uh, namely the CPTPP, the RCEP, and the African Continental uh, Free Trade Agreement. So uh, it's, a, it's a quite extensive scope, and we are uh, uh, advancing, uh, currently uh, concluding our six months of uh, uh, research phase one already concluded when phase two is to be concluded by the end of the year. Um, we have uh, some uh, products already um, to uh, to discuss in, uh, uh, some of them in uh, inside uh, IPEA and and one that is already uh, uh, ready to be published uh, as uh, Fernando already mentioned in the next edition of IPEA's bulletin. Uh, but we would like to uh, some uh, uh, some major uh, highlights on these three products because it, it's through uh, through which we are working um, on some methodologies that we were uh, trying to uh, uh, extract some comparative analysis uh, on the on these three agreements. Uh, our first uh, uh, block of products are the uh, executive summaries. Uh, they have a slightly different uh, profile compared to the, the executive summaries that we all uh, access uh, that are the, the institutional official public ones made by the secretariats of the agreements. We are focusing on more technical issues uh, uh, in terms of memberships, uh, in terms of uh, a session process, and especially uh, dealing with the regulatory framework. Uh, they are they have a common structure, so they are easy to compare, easy to analyze uh, transver transversely, 
and uh, they have an important uh, aspect to highlight that there is uh, this kind of material is still uh, is still unpublished uh, uh, in Portuguese. So when we have these kinds of material uh, published in uh, in Portuguese, we will have an important uh, uh, assets provided by this uh, IPEA project. Uh, the a second uh, product that we are working on is this legal matrix. Uh, we're basically working on an Excel format uh, over 1,000 cells with uh, already filled in with qualitative information through which we are trying to identify, disaggregate, delimit uh, the, the very uh, uh, specific details of each uh, uh, rule, discipline, and provision uh, to try to advance in comparative ways, uh, to try to systematize and uh, obtain some degree of comparative uh, ability uh, of these three agreements. And we also need to advance with this, uh, this progress towards uh, priorities, uh, Brazilian uh, current priorities uh, that were sent to IPEA and to our project uh, by, uh, by Itamarachi. Uh, and we will comment on this uh, later on. And our comparative analysis, that is the main core of our presentation today with some preliminary uh, parameters that we already have identified. They are currently under validation. And this seminar is an important uh, space and moment to, uh, to exchange uh, opinions and uh, information on these, on these, um, on these parameters. Um, Basically, uh, we're, we're dealing with uh, three, uh, they're not mega regional, they're not mega agreements, not only in terms of trade, they're not mega regionals, not only in terms of uh, number of uh, members, they're also uh, in terms of uh, legal texts. And uh, we'll uh, analyze this from a, in, a, a perspective of a legal density, and we'll comment on this during this uh, brief uh, uh, slide. Uh, when we deal with uh, uh, agreements that we have uh, over 30 chapters, like TPV, uh, 20 chapters of RECEPT, and only three protocols when you got the African Continental Free Trade Area. Um, and uh, we will try to reflect uh, during the project, uh, why is this important? Why is legal density uh, uh, important and does it matter? Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, one important uh, element already compared in, in terms of comparing structures is the, these highlighted chapters that we have here uh, in terms of uh, chapters that were present in TPP and not present in uh, uh, and on the other uh, agreements, not present a priori, uh, because uh, an in-depth uh, analysis of RCEP uh, allowed us to identify regulation uh, dealing with textiles, dealing with state-owned enterprise, dealing with regulatory coherence and transparency development in also in RCEP. So uh, analyze, analysts uh, sometimes hurry to affirm that these chapters do not exist in RCEP which is not uh, completely uh, true because uh, a substantial mapping of these chapters is of these agreements uh, uh, needs to be duly deepened uh, and will be one of the central uh, um, objectives of this present uh, work. Um, so uh, does uh, legal density matter? Uh, this is a first reflection, a first uh, thought that we bear care in mind. Uh, maybe uh, not so much in terms of trade flows in terms of the definition of, of investments, uh, of uh, migration of uh, intellectual property and the, the, the core uh, structure of value chains. But it, it's, it does uh, matter when we deal with standards and regulations, as Fernando already mentioned, uh, uh, the, the core uh, transformation uh, that are, is being promoted by these agreements. And uh, we can, we will, uh, in advance of this uh, uh, this study, uh, focus on those chapters do that some uh, that uh, bring uh, the principle of the right to regulate uh, to uh, to the agreement. Uh, this gives some room for maneuver for some uh, of these the state parties, which are important in terms of uh, dealing with uh, this scope of regulation 
um, in strategic uh, and specific uh, sectors and disciplines. Uh, and uh, and, 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 and another, another important um, uh, layer of analysis on India's agreements are the institutional aspects of the agreements. What uh, level of institutionality do they apport? Uh, the uh, transparency mechanisms uh, brought by the, the agreements, uh, the, me uh, the cooperation mechanisms uh, to the, the bilateral dialogues, and of course, uh, dispute settlement uh, is in the core of the institutional aspects of these agreements. So all of these, uh, these um, Are we, did we carry, carry on? Can I carry on? Okay. Um, do we, next, uh, this is a, a, a this, this next slide, uh, although uh, very small to, to, to read, uh, the purpose uh, is exact, uh, exactly to illustrate by one hand what legal density means, uh, the amount of disciplines covered, total of chapters, annexes, and pages, and the other hand, the disciplines that are substantially covered in chapters, not formally named by the discipline. So here we can, uh, in red, you can highlight some of these chapters that I have already uh, uh, pointed out uh, that normally, uh, usually are uh, identified as uh, a, a unique uh, contribution of TPP, but we are also already detecting them inside uh, our SEP in different levels, in different uh, approaches, but they are there and uh, we will uh, carry on advancing on this uh, comparative analysis. Um, in this uh, last, uh, uh, next and last slide that uh, corresponds to my presentation and then Marina will take the floor. Uh, we, one important aspect here to analyze uh, is to uh, identify uh, some an, an aspect that has been identified during the preliminary analysis of these three agreements that relates to the negotiation modalities adopted by state parties. Here, um, uh, either uh, Secretary Ferraz and Ambassador Pedro Miguel uh, pointed out this, uh, this the importance of this uh, of this uh, of this aspect. Uh, in all three agreements, we detected the use of flexible negotiating uh, modalities in different degrees, uh, in different areas, uh, in, and for different reasons, of course. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they are, it is always present in all three mega regional agreements. Uh, we define them uh, as built-in agendas, uh, as a positive uh, uh, aspect of uh, this negotiation modality. Uh, we've we've the, the, we've identified uh, uh, um, several modalities in terms of different schedules, depending the the state parties, extended deadlines for uh, presenting offers, scope definitions of some regulations, chapters and sectors that are pending to start negotiations, and disciplines and sectors that are already subject uh, to renegotiation. And not, not the, the the agreement has not yet yet entered into force and they already established uh, renegotiation and of course some waivers. Uh, I will not enter into details for each of these disciplines, uh, but we do uh, acknowledge is that all these modalities allow the parties to achieve this consensus. And this is vital for agreements of this magnitude. And uh, what is a successful, successfully concluded agreement? Uh, or when can we consider this agreement successfully concluded. Uh, this is a, a question that uh, uh, we, we have to try to understand, especially uh, dealing with, uh, with terms of uh, flexibility, uh, which brings these important insights on the current debate that Brazil and Mercosul's external trade relations strategy is, is arising. Uh, these mega agreements adopted interesting, flexible methodologies and techniques that can enlighten some of Mercosul's dilemmas on negotiating and concluding trade agreements with trade par parties. So this is uh, this is going to be an interesting uh, element uh, that will arise uh, from this research to understand uh, techniques of uh, negotiating and concluding uh, agreements uh, using the uh, the paradigm of uh, flexibility. Um, now, uh, thank you for your uh, uh, attention. Now, Marina will carry on with the with our presentation. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you all. Thank you for being here and for participating of this, this project. 
Uh, Fernando, on behalf of your name, I would like to to greet everybody. So let's uh, and all, all the the members here. Um, and without any more any more delay, please next slide. Uh, próximo slide. Uh, and then I'm going to con continue a little bit of our preliminary results. So one of the questions that we've made was basically how these agreements coexist with other rules, WTO rules, and previous agreements and. Uh, actually, uh, like most FTAs, those agreements uh, restate uh, their environment within the WTO rules. They restate that previous rules that are more favorable than the rules that were settled in those agreements should prevail. Uh, but there is a small difference in RCEP where it privileges most the Asian agreement, the Asian plus one agreement, especially on trade facilitation and uh, uh, special and differential treatment for LDCs. I think, uh, uh, in our view, this is already part of a concern in order to include uh, countries that are in very different economic positions within the same environment. Uh, we will see this is going through our set very deeply, and and uh, and and that's something that we are going to to deep a little bit further. The continental African agreement the, it goes further because it. It tries to put the eight main F African FTAs uh, together on the same standard. So the idea and the project is to have a continental MFN rule. Uh, but of course, we know some FTAs in Africa are much more mature than the ones that are being settled right now, including the African continental FTA. So the idea is to take advantage of those rules and include it within uh, the new African agreement. Uh, next slide, please. Próximo slide. Uh, so when we go a little bit further, and I think that's the main uh, reflection that we've made so far, is that the potential for renewal and expansion of multilateral rules based on those three agreements are very, very important and sensitive, especially on these three uh, pillars that we, we made it uh, in this slide. First, uh, the three agreements uh, can accept new members, and as you know, we have already several candidates for the CPTPP. UK is is uh, in on, on the top of this of this race. Um, possibly, if negotiations go well, it's possible that it finishes for, before the others. Then we have the the almost concomitant applications from China and Taiwan, and others just thinking about or talking about like the EU or the US, like uh, uh, Professor Vera already mentioned uh, at the beginning. So um, the possibility of having new members in these agreements is a very, very solid possibility to have the expansion of those rules. And then uh, you have the reallocation of international rules from the multilateral level to a regional level, especially on rules that were never regulated before and subjects that were never regulated before and that are encompassed in some of those agreements, especially in the CPTPP. So we see, uh, for example, the RCEP. The RCEP um, is uh, much more market access driven, so it doesn't have many behind the borders measures in depth like the CPTPP, and that, that's a huge difference because we were talking before uh, in the previous talks about joining or not joining, and maybe joining or joining, not joining, that's the question right now. But the, pro, the, the, the thing is, uh, when you have an agreement like the CPTPP, which is very big in trade flows, like the RCEP, and have very deep rules, we are going through rules that are being are regulated situations behind the border. So, so we are talking about behind the border measures. Why this is so important? Because the logics of negotiating behind the border measures are completely different from negotiating market access. Market access have a protectionist view in, in, intrinsic to the negotiation. But when you are looking for behind the more border measures, you are talking about costs. You are talking about raising costs and hiring, uh, elevating standards. Um, and that's something that sometimes most countries cannot follow or cannot accompany. That means uh, in, uh, in the end of the day that if the measure is 
behind the border. It's a, an environmental standard. And it's raising a new cost on consumers. Countries will have to pay another kind of attention in order to say, I can agree with that. It depends if its uh, level of development can comply with those rules, if can reach those costs, and if can turn those costs in an opportunity. It's different from lowering tariffs where you basically cut the costs. CPTPP is an agreement that goes beyond WTO rules, it settles behind the border measures, are much more innovative than the RCEP, and at the same time brings the discussion, uh, does it create trade diversion? It shouldn't from a de jure perspective because it's the same environmental standard that is being applied on a MFN basis, but it creates a trade, it, ca it can create a trade diversion de facto. Why? Because maybe my country cannot follow these standards, cannot comply with this standard, and then it's raising a cost and it's driving uh, the value chain to other countries. So uh, we see a very big difference here because RCEP has a potential to regionalize value chains Next, next slide, próximo slide, please. Uh, why does it uh, RCEP can uh, create a regional value chain? Because it's very market access driven. So that means uh, the rules of origin are going to be important for goods. For services, they are they were not so successful, but for goods, they were very important. And Countries that are within those uh, those borders are going to be able to negotiate, uh, to export, and to create trade flows very significantly. Whereas when you look at the CPTPP, beyond market access, you have the situation of behind the border measures. And then behind, besides the trade creation and the regional value chain, you have or an opportunity or a very big cost to lose that market. You can gain the market if you can reach those standards, those those uh, rules that were settled behind the borders. But if you cannot do it, then you are losing the market. And if you are losing the market, you are losing market access to ICE because you are not within the group and you are not following those rules. So um, we see this new regulatory uh, structure in CPTPP in several chapters listed in this slide. We have uh, an uh, understood that CPTPP provides with a potential influence for internal reforms. Because if I want to reach the market of that country without joining the CPTPP, I can do it, but I have to follow those rules. And in order to follow those rules, I have to make reforms. So there is a very important stimulus uh, to uh, new policies, internal policies for every country, not only the countries that are within the the CPTPP uh, uh, um, structure, whereas the RCEP is going to incentivate much more market access and trade flow within the within the within the group. Uh, lastly, and I'm going to pass uh, again to Marcus to close up. Next slide, please. I just would like to uh, put some other uh, um, implications here to be. Uh, uh, thought for Brazil when we think about the future we have to we have to put on the same basket G, uh, JSI rules that are being negotiated right now at the WTO when we might see at MC12 new agreements new joint statement initiatives this is going to be really relevant when you look at the CPTP P or RCEP for example why because these are, are also plurilateral initiatives. And if those rules are very different from the rules that we have on a regional mega trade agreement, we're basically creating even more complexity to the global system. So we have to pay attention to that. At the same time, uh, like it, Ambassador on, already mentioned and Marcus is stressed in, 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 its talk, in his talk, we, uh, when we are negotiating, and we, we thought we, we saw that in the text of the agreement, uh, rules that are based on standards and they are not commerce regulations, so to speak. So we're talking about environmental law, labor law, state enterprises, uh, antitrust, competition. Uh, you, you see countries included variable geometry within negotiations. 
meaning that countries have to be considered individually and they have to have time, they must have time to adapt in order to comply with those rules. And each country has a time and a pace to follow those rules after entering the agreement. And then you have India and China. India is not within the agreements, but they but have bilateral agreements with all countries of the of the region. So it's out, but it's not out when you look at trade flow. And that's very important for Brazil to take into consideration. And what's the concrete possibility of China joining the CPTPP? This is a huge question. I heard Vera already. I want to I want to 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 I'm curious to go further on that. We know it's difficult, but we know the countries are very important. The, the, the countries take China in deep importance in their trade flows. So that's something also that has to be considered. And, and then we look to Brazil's main priorities and its strategic interests. What does Brazil want uh, with those uh, mega trade agreements? I think uh, we had a, a, previous, uh, a previous talk that mentioned already that we have interest in that region. And I think Marcos have some uh, further considerations on that. I think uh, Marcos can conclude and uh, we are open for, for questions and to, to go deeper on that. I thank you very much. Marcos, please go on. Just uh, quickly to, to comment and to uh, reestablish a uh, uh, line of thought that we were we, we uh, commented in the beginning uh, during uh, with this uh, communication we received from Itamarachi through uh, through Itaia, uh, with the uh, position uh, a document uh, which we had uh, the negotiated positions of Brazil in a, a list of several trade disciplines uh, that are currently uh, on the table for. Uh, for Brazil in terms of uh, trade negotiation, uh, trade negotiations, and uh, it's a document that's related to a project that I was involved during the period I was in Mercosur's international staff as a legal advisor. Uh, for the last uh, years, um, uh, we were working uh, uh, with uh, supporting uh, Mercosur's uh, external uh, agenda, especially uh, through Comissão de Comércio and Grelex. And one of these projects demanded exactly this uh, kind of interaction with the uh, focal points of the four capitals. And this document that uh, we received is part of this process. And it's interesting to see how uh, we, 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 the objective of uh, conciliating um, these, uh, uh, in, uh, these uh, national positions into a common regional position is still uh, in the movement, yes? It's... <laughs> Your time is over. Okay, uh, we have the just uh, so just one uh, last uh, slide so we can conclude uh, because uh, the next uh, one, please. Because it is uh, related uh, to uh, one important objective of this project that is to compare some of the most innovative disciplines and chapters of these three mega agreements with Brazil's regulatory framework. Uh, this was highlighted by Secre uh, Secretary Ferraz and also by Ambassador Pedro Miguel, how Brazil has uh, in the last year, uh, the last uh, few years, uh, made a huge effort uh, to uh, modernize its regulatory uh, framework. Uh, and uh, we cannot uh, take, uh, undermine the importance of these recent advances. Uh, and uh, one important step of this uh, research project will be to compare the regulatory framework uh, that is presented by these mega regionals uh, with Brazil's recent modernization of its regulatory uh, framework, either uh, through interregional efforts like the ones we've mentioned. We can see all the disciplines that we are highlighting as uh, 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 modern uh, last uh, the, uh, level agreements and also inside these extra regional agreements that Brazil is concluding uh, through uh, Mercosul. So this is just to highlight and to put into, into our regional and national co contemporary context. Fernando, uh, so, uh, so I think Marina, uh, with, with this we conclude. Uh, Fernando, sorry for uh, uh, stepping uh, into uh, the next uh, presenta uh, presentator's uh, time, but uh, it was an effort to try to uh, conclude our pres our uh, six months of presentation in these 20 minutes. Uh, thank you, Marina. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you all. 
Okay, Marcos, Marina, thank you very much. Well, it's very clear that the, the these agreements have different regulations, different in depth, in reach, uh, in innovative rules, but they represent a challenge for the countries that are outside the agreement and, and also for the multilateral stance of negotiations. And this, it's a work in progress. And so they will also work on, on special issues like technical standards, uh, environmental matters, rules of origin, and many things that are important to be considered in this mega regional in their impacts. Uh, so now I pass the floor to Wesley Faria, who's professor of the Federal University of Juiz de Fora and visiting researcher at IPEA, to talk about uh, his work with Admir Betarelli, considering the impacts of the the these three agreements on the Brazilian economy. Wesley. Well, uh, good afternoon uh, to all. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today, and uh, I'd like to thank Fernando for the invitation. Uh, unlike the previous presentation, our focus was to merge the effects on Brazil like one of the three mega trade ag agreements. So, uh, most of the information shared here today by Marina and Marcos was new for me. It, Somehow, and I will try my best to present in 15 minutes. Fernando, you control the time, please. Uh, I have to share my presentation. I was set. Uh, okay. Uh, here you can see the outline of this presentation. I have only uh, 15 minutes, so it's not too much to, to uh, time to go very deep in details about the study. But I'll try to uh, summarize it as much as possible. I will present very briefly the introduction, some information about the agreements. Maybe this some information about the agreements is not that important because the previous presentation, but some. Uh, important information about the agreements, then methodology, many results, and conclusions. Uh, so, uh, the goal of this study is to evaluate the impacts of international mega agreements on Brazil economy. Uh, these three agreements are uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. I will call this agreement our RC uh, agreement for short. Uh, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement of a for specific partnership, I will call this agreement of CPT agreement for short, and uh, the African Continental Free Trade, I will call this agreement of a AFC uh, for short as well. In order to achieve this goal, we applied a, uh, a global CG mod, the GTAP. Uh, I apologize in advance, but uh, I caught a flu. Uh, three days ago, then my throat and my nose are killing me, so I will try to uh, speak uh, as fast as possible. Uh, <clears throat> here you can see the, some information about the first agreement evaluated, the RC. Uh, this agreement is composed by one region, uh, Asia, and other five countries, China, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, Asia is economic bloc for, formed by Brunei, Cambodia, and other countries. Uh, these countries combined represent around 30% of the world's GDP and population. Uh, once run, the agreement aims to eliminate tariffs for 90% of goods trade between uh, participating members over a 20-year period. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, here you can see some information about CPT agreement, which is another agreement evaluated in this study. And uh, this agreement includes 11 countries, if I'm not mistaken. And these countries represent together about 13.5% of the world GDP, with a market of 500 million consumers and 
and the trade volume of $356 billion. Uh, this information is for 2017, uh, available on a World Bank uh, website. Uh, this agreement was signed in 2018. It was also no because the United States has uh, people said this before was the one main motivator of the agreement. But President uh, Donald Trump did allow to do to, to allow the United States to enter. Uh, another reason of particular interest about this agreement is that the UK has shown some strong interest in enjoying the agreement. I don't know uh, how far is this negotiation. Uh, the goal of this agreement is to eliminate tariffs and reduce, uh, reduce tar uh, barriers to 98% of exports among uh, members. Uh, the AFC is agreement that includes 54 countries uh, on the African continent. Uh, because of that, uh, this agreement is the largest free trade area in the world. Uh, the countries involved the combined uh, account for 0.3 billion people and a GDP of about $3.4 trillion. Uh, this agreement was signed in 2018. Uh, uh, complete information would be achieved consider a later period of another five years. Uh, a particular aspect of uh, the tariff structure in trade uh, between uh, Africa countries that tariffs are highly concentrated in some sectors or activities. 1% of tariffs lines account for 74% uh, of in, uh, imports, according to a, a World Bank study. Uh, <clears throat> uh, now, uh, some information about the main aspects of the methodology. We use the JATAP mode to run the policy associated with uh, each agreement. Uh, originally, JATAP 10, which is the JATAP version, uh, calibrated for the year 2014, recognizes 65 commodities, uh, 141 uh, world regions. For which agreement, we built a model uh, with 27 sectors, and the number of regions vary according to the agreement to be evaluated. Uh, the model version we used was the uh, recursive dynamics uh, version. Uh, here we have a graphical representation of how the model with the recursive dynamics works. Two types of simulations uh, was performed. Uh, the first one is the baseline simulation. The second one is called policy simulation. Uh, the baseline simulation is uh, intended to provide a reference scenario. Uh, set simulation provides the, provides the trend and trajectory uh, of the economy, and the simulation is divided into two orders, uh, the historical simulation and the project simulation. Uh, the difference between historical simulation and project simulation is that historical simulation uses no information about the economy, uh, whereas uh, project simulation uses estimates on macroeconomic indicators. In the case of this study, uh, we use the only information estimated by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, uh, from 2014 to 2025. So, why do we uh, want to look at? Uh, sorry, uh, I was forget about uh, the the policy simulation. The policy simulation represents the simulation of shocks on tariffs from the operation from the operation of each agreement. So what we want to look at is the difference between baseline simulation, uh, which provides a project of the economy without the agreements, and policy simulation. The difference between the two trajectories, the gap in the graphic, as we show here, is the effect on international trade agreement. Uh, <clears throat> here we can see the shocks applied to GDP for each region in a baseline simulation. So the values used for shock uh, for the period 2027 to 2040 are the same applied for the year 2026. 
And I am showing here only the values used for the evaluation of RC agreements, but for the other agreements are the same thing. Uh, the same thing was done. Uh, <clears throat> somebody uh, may ask, but does the INF have uh, estimates of GDP variation for these regions? The answer is no. Uh, uh, for example, for the rest of uh, East Asia and the rest of the world, we don't have the estimation for IMF. Then the values for each region here, uh, we calculate based on the share of each country GDP in the region as a weighted uh, factor. Uh, is, this is a, uh, uh, a detail, but uh, I'm explaining because some, somebody can uh, may uh, ask me about the, the, the these values presented here in, in this table. Uh, another point is that uh, RC agreement, for example, is not composed of four regions, but this, the, this region is structured was used because it requires uh, less process uh, effort, computa uh, computational uh, uh, effort without preju prejudice to assessment of the effects uh, of the agreement uh, on Brazilian economy. When you form the regions for the aggre aggregation of cultures, the tariff structure is also considered uh, weighted in JETAP. So instead of using Australia and New Zealand, these two countries uh, have been aggregated uh, into a regional that we call Oceania, which, which carries the tariff structure of international trade by weighting in the tariff structure of Australia and New Zealand. So this probably will, uh, would be a question raised by Lucas. Uh, <clears throat> for the policy simulation uh, uh, of the RC agreement, uh, a 90% uh, reduction in import tariffs and a 90% reduction in not tariff from 2021 until 2040 uh, were considered. Uh, tariff and non-tariff elimination was uniform in a period. Uh, for the, pos the purpose of uh, tariff elimination, the tariffs in the JATAP database for the year 2000 and 2021 were, were used as reference. Uh, so, the, this data were obtained from the baseline simulations between 2014 and 2021. Altogether, uh, the, the tariffs of 432 trade relations containing a trade between the members of, of the RC agreement were uh, reduced. reduced. Uh, here we have the same explanation for the CPT in the AFC agreements. In the case of the CPT agreement, we consider a reduction of 98% in tariffs and no tariff over 15 years. In the case of uh, AFC agreement, uh, we consider a reduction of 19% 19, uh, 19% of uh, in tariffs and no tariffs uh, between 2000 in 20, in 2025. Uh, in the remaining reduction of 10% between 2000 and 26 in 2035 uh, was applied. Uh, for each agreement, uh, here I can see. Uh, <clears throat> oh, here. Uh, for each agreement, uh, what we did in practical terms with the model was to verify the tariff structure for the last year prior to uh, the application of uh, the shocks by running the baseline simulations. Uh, uh, the JATAP recogni uh, recognizes tariffs in form of tariff power, which is uh, one plus the tariff. Uh, this value is, is contained in the JATAP database. Therefore, the policy simulations were applied, uh, considering the percentage change in tariff power uh, for the operation of each agreement. Uh, to take into account the uh, reduction of non-tariffs, we use the World Bank's uh, ad valor equivalent, econometric uh, estimates, 
uh, these estimates were divided between technical and non-technical barriers. Uh, we run simulation considering each of these uh, barriers. Uh, there are other estimates like the one in new study, uh, as Fernando presented to us. Uh, but the, uh, 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 they, they, but they, they did have the, this, this distinct between uh, 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 technical barriers and uh, not technical barriers. So we prefer to use the, the World Bank's uh, estimates. Uh, <clears throat> so we choose the World Bank estimates. One of the downsides of the estimates was used is that there, there were no estimates for some countries, such as Korea. So uh, we use a hypothesis that this, the structure of barriers in this country is similar uh, to, to others uh, in the region, such as Japan. Where is it? So, wait. Three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> okay. So the uh, results. Finally, <laughs> uh, finally the, barriers, the, the variables that affect the volume of trade in a model were, were used as policies, for, for example, to elimination not tariff but here is the technical term it was was used i uh, i was explaining this so, some details because i thought uh, uh lucas was here he was uh, curious about what what we did uh, to to run the simulation so i i will go fast how, uh, now in uh, the main results uh <clears throat> So here we can see the effects on the Brazilian economy of the RC agreement accumulated up to 2040. We have the total effect, the total effect is separated by tariff and non-tariff effects. Uh, we also have the effect in percent change in billion, in billions of dollars. In general, GDP investment costs uh, would have a negative variation. The drop in GDP would be minus 0.45%. Or 10.92 billion dollars. Uh, trade current or trade flow is uh, export plus uh, imports. Uh, exports would remain virtually unchanged. Uh, <clears throat> the drop in, in imports can be explained by trade diversion. Uh, uh, the, the, the agreement makes uh, makes cheaper. Uh, to trade the goods between other countries then that are part of the agreement negatively uh, impact the trade relations to uh, of other countries that are outside uh, the agreement another point is uh, the results are set set as paribus uh, therefore no other exo exogenous response to agreement is considered uh, here we can see the, the same results for the cpt uh, agreement uh, all educates would be negatively affected except exports. So we can see this agreement would affect the indicators less than RC agreement. Uh, GDP uh, would have a drop of minus 0.9% or to uh, 0.16 billion dollars. Uh, here we can see the, the results of the AFC uh, agreement. Uh, the effects would be even smaller than those of the CPT agreement. GDP would fall menos 0.3% of 0.65 uh, billion dollars. Uh, uh, here you can see results on trade balance of the RC agreement. Brazil exports would grow, except for China. Brazil ex imports would fall further in relation to China. Uh, as exports, exports grow a little uh, and imports for more sharply, the trade balance would have a positive balance. Uh, of, uh, however, uh, due, the, due to the greater drop in imports than the increase in exports, the trade flow or trade stream, as we call it here, would be negative, around $3 billion. Uh, here we can see the, the result for the CPT agreement. Uh, Brazil exports and imports to Japan fall further. Again, 
there will be a positive trade balance, but a drop in trade stream. Uh, here you can see the, the results for the FC agreement. Uh, the aggregated results are very similar to those of the other two agreements, but the effects are smaller. I mean, uh, are even smaller. Uh, here, export would fall under <clears throat> other agreements, export would increase. That's the, the difference. Uh, here you can see some uh, uh, sector results. Uh, in the report, we present results with tri uh, time and trajectory here. For simplicity, I want to show the results accumulate which is the final period of the simulation. Uh, uh, here you can see that only few uh, uh, sectors of Brazilian sectors of uh, uh, the RC agreement, only a few would have a positive effect on production, cereals, uh, extractive uh, textiles, for example. A few would increase exports, but this increase is relatively small compared to falls uh, and pox would fall overall. The falls would be greater in industry, industry sectors. Uh, here we can see the CPT uh, results. Yeah. Also, uh, we can see that uh, some primary, primary extractive uh, sectors have in production exports positive effect, but the industrial sectors, again, would have a negative uh, effect. Uh, uh, finally, uh, we can see the FC agreement results, and again, the effects are some kind uh, similar, positive effects on primary sectors and more negative effects on industrial uh, sectors. Uh, key, uh, here we open the, the, the effects on destination of Brazil exports for uh, sectors. Uh, the results are accumulated. We saw that Brazil exports grow under RC and CPT agreements and fall uh, under the AFC agreement. So, these values are here, uh, in, we can see these results in a, in a, less, in a, in a less line. Uh, in in uh, three agreements, the extractive uh, sector would be the one that would uh, increase exports the most. Uh, we can see this result in dark green. And the RC and CPT agreement, some service, service sectors would ha also have greater positive variation. Uh, uh, now, some conclusions. Uh, uh, the three agreements would negatively impact Brazil GDP as well the trade stream or trade flow. Only a few primary sectors would be positively affected, while industrial sectors would be uh, the most negatively affected in terms of production and imports. Uh, this is the last slide. Therefore, the most affected sectors positively or negatively and the amount of the effects of each agreement uh, may indicate which agreements uh, may be more interest for Brazil to be concerned about and prepare for in terms of uh, business opportunity. That's it. Thanks for your attention. Okay, Wesley, thank you very much. Um, and I pass uh, directly to Vera Tortesen to show their study, their results, and then we can discuss better. Thank you very much. I'm trying to 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 compartilate, compartilar, compartilar. Let's see if it works. Yes, no, yes. Great. Uh, uh, well, let me tell a little bit about the history of this project, and I, I, I not, have no intention to, to discuss all the digital issues. The idea behind this uh, project is the following. Uh, uh, during all the whole W2 and that life, uh, when you talk about regional arrangements, you talk about uh, article, the famous Article 24, and uh, the, the agreement said that Okay, you can do regional arrangements, but you cannot uh, interfere in the life of other countries in the sense that before and after 
uh, the countries that are not part of the green cannot be worst. Now, the, this is true, our own, the, our life uh, for uh, small agreements. But now, what is different? Uh, what you're seeing is a, a new world where you have three huge mega, what I call mega agreements. It's not only a, a three a big, uh, uh, what uh, uh, Lucas said about the fabric, it's true, three different fabrics. And you have three different systems of trade. And the question is, how can you measure and show that uh, these mega agreements can uh, affect other countries? This is the idea behind our project, right? So what we did, okay, let's see if it moves. No, yes or not? No, it's not moving. Oh, 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 oh yes. Look, um, Sorry, it, it jumps. Okay, wait a minute because I have a marvelous uh, uh, spa. That's it. <laughs> we choose uh, 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 five countries that are emerging and they are not part of this mega. And to show this all on the right side. And that oh, you can see RCEP is the big one, Asian here. And then you have a, a kind of uh, a, an amalgamation and uh, the transposition of one uh, uh, country to the other. And this kind of uh, 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 systems interlinked is not a, is, is a thing that Brazil does not uh, um, uh, uh, see and do not participate. Uh, so the idea is to see how these uh, mega arrangements do affect these emerging countries that are outside, Brazil, Russia, South Africa, Argentina, and India. Uh, Russia has an agreement with Vietnam. Uh, South Africa has some agreements uh, uh, around the region of South Africa and uh, the big one, but is the, 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 the impact on trade is not so big. Argentina has a, an agreement with Chile, and Brazil has an agreement with Chile, as Lucas said, it's true. But what's different is about India. India has an agreement with Japan, Chile, South Korea, and Asia. And this is be, uh, uh, will appear during this, the, the, our exercise. And here you have the European Union, not alone, all the time enlarging uh, itself to other countries, right? Now, uh, what you did is you not create a new, uh, but a, a new group of the more isolated emerging countries. And here you have the numbers and I uh, that you can see how big they are, right? Uh, and this is a thing that is important to see the size. TPP 12 are set in European Union and they have already 70% of the global imports and exports uh, and 75% of GDP. In our simulation, we use a CPTPT and we use uh, USMCA. So, we did, uh, we did a, a kind of 12, TPP 12 and TPP 11, all the time we play with this, right? And here are the emerging countries alone. Uh, just to show a little bit um, uh, how is the, the impact of China in these agreements, and uh, certainly you can read this much better in the, the, the article, right? I think this exercise is to, to convince you to to, uh, incent, uh, to give you an incentive to go to the to, to read the paper. Now you have the 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 the, the, the problem of Brazil. Uh, how important is TPP 12 for 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 Brazil? And here you have the numbers of the country that are uh, around. And uh, and here you have imports and exports. And you see the importance of the the for TPP of the United States, right? Uh, if you do not include TPP as uh, United States here, certainly you have to put United States uh, as a, a mega in itself because of the of the size of the United States, right? And we did for RCEP the same to show the import of China and the importance of in, in export in uh, imports to 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 Brazil. Uh, in our exercise, uh, what we did is uh, we before the the, the simulation. Look the the orange and the blue. Look how the what is funny is tariff apply for emerging countries are much bigger than are bigger than the ones used for uh, the countries 
in uh, not only CPTPP, but also in uh, TPP uh, 12 or 11. So this is a thing that emerging countries, they, they use, they have a bigger tariff, right? This is the same for uh, RCEP. This is uh, to say how a tariff is still important for emerging countries. What did we did in the simulation? As uh, Ikea show, we have a, a policy and uh, um, scenario and uh, the, in the baseline, it's all the tap. And what is important in doing a different tabs is about the scenarios. And so uh, the machinery behind the tab is the same, the numbers are the same, but the, the nicety of uh, using the tab is to, to change a little bit the, uh, the, um, the, the hypothesis behind it. And so what Vito, uh, my group and Vito, uh, mainly Vito, uh, who did this other simulation, we uh, used the same, uh, uh, the, the same uh, uh, bibliography that's uh, the, uh, uh, used in GTAB, and we did a different things that we, uh, we made our uh, simulation uh, after the, the agreement of our set. So we use uh, the, the real numbers, not the, the negotiation, the negotiating numbers. And for, uh, and for the, the, because the, the European Union, the last agreement are not included in the basis of the top, we include the new agreements of the, the European Union, right? Uh, go ahead. Here are the, the, the steps that we did, all the steps, how do we include uh, and try to include in the tariff uh, all the, the steps of negotiation of our set and TPP. And here is to see uh, the tariff elimination. How you see the TPP, how, uh, how, how important is the amount of zero tariffs already? Look, uh, the, the, the TPP, they, they start on the, on a basis of a very important uh, uh, amount of tariff that are zero already, right? And here's a more, uh, the, the way we calculate a, a, a little bit different from the IPEA. Uh, here are the, the and Vitor, is, Vitor arrives here, he can explain much more uh, better than I. Uh, that is uh, all, uh, the, all the sen sensible sector for TPP-12. For Japan, Canada, and Mexico, you see there's no problem for the United States. And in the NTM uh, uh, calculations, we use a different exercise made by two uh, persons from the GTAP group, and this is available here, the, the reference. They use a cost reduction uh, methodology a little bit different from uh, what the, the, the usually they did. The same for uh, RCEP. Uh, and let's go to the results. Look, what you can see is a, a, a lot of uh, red lights, right? And this is the main, uh, most important uh, consequence. Uh, the impact of the, these mega uh, agreements on the merging countries are huge and are quite similar uh, 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 with the results uh, of what IPEA calculated, right? Look, the majority of numbers are green, so negative effect. You can say, okay, but India has a, a positive numbers. But look, uh, what India has as a positive is for GDP, for RCEP and RCEP and TPP-12, investment, but not for trade. So even for India, you have a negative impact on trade. You have a negative for South Africa, except for uh, uh, for uh, export and import. But the majority of the countries has a negative impact. So uh, the the emerging countries considered in this agreement in, in this in this exercise shows the importance of uh, to see what's going on behind the, the, these numbers, right? And we looked for trade diversion to, in the case of Brazil and made for the other countries also to see how, uh, uh, what would be the impacts using uh, the, for the, the TPP 12, uh, uh, 11 and RCEP and uh, not RCEP. Uh, so we made all the possible calculations and they are negative all the time, right? Uh, if you, we go to the, the sectorial impacts, uh, what is funny is that uh, 
let's see uh, boots to compare with the pair that for other machines that is electrical machines of the tap you have it's true it's positive for gdp because of consumption internal consumption but not for trade look of the size of the the the, the, the red line showing that for all sector this is quite similar what you pay uh, get that is uh, these agreements are going to impact uh, negatively the majority of the sectors right here you have you know, the and what is important is here are the emerging countries the, the five countries that we consider the negative uh, results and see what's happened with the members of cptpp only you can see uh, that the, the green lights are bigger, right? For the members inside, uh, exclusively inside the countries of the, the megas, the results are really also positive, right? Now, let's go to the conclusion. So we have time to discuss and time for Cicero to talk a little bit about what you can do in the future. That is uh, the conclusion. For the emerging countries, all you face cost of isolations. Uh, it's true that uh, uh, that we, do, we did not consider including a Mercosur uh, European Union yet in this simulation because, as you all, all of you know, this is going to take a, a much more time, a little more time because of concerns of the European Union with climate. So let's be uh, let's face the reality. It is important, really important, to have a, a European um, uh, Mercosur scenario. But this is not for now, right? Uh, the cost will be certainly worse when you consider all the, the three big matters. The results for India must uh, you have to is a little bit different because not only uh, because India it, this is really important. India has a a, a a network of agreements with all Asia, with Korea, Japan, with Asia. So it's uh, it's it's important for us. Uh, in the case of Brazil, to show how uh, India gets uh, compens uh, compensate this the negative results uh, doing uh, agreements with the the, uh, the Asian uh, uh, region, and this is important in terms of uh, the conclusion for Brazil because, as you know, enterprises in Brazil are really uh, reluctant in the, doing this agreement. So this shows the importance of having agreements with the Asian uh, region. Uh, uh, here is a, a nice ex uh, exercise also for the U.S. showing the importance of the U.S. joining the, the TPP 11 again. And uh, well, we used we we spent a lot of time discussing to include U.S. or not. Uh, I think that for all the, the uh, panels that I'm watching, there's a lot of uh, 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 conclusions saying that. With the, the intention of China to, to to join to join in, probably the U.S. will reformulate a little bit uh, its its future. And what's uh, Marina, What is important to remember is that look at the level of the groups of China. They are really shallow agreements. They are not at the level of TPP 11. So uh, for the negotiation of China inside the TPP 11. This will take a long, long time because the, the, they are completely different uh, kind of agreements, right? Um, the, the, this shows the importance of Brazil ratifying the, the Mercosur agreement, certainly. And this is for, for the value to people that are here. Uh, look, uh, I spend all my life discussing that um, in the uh, Article 24, you cannot uh, have, uh, you cannot impact negatively uh, the, the other countries. And here you have uh, five big emerging countries that are uh, uh, clearly being affected by this mega agreement. So the idea is to see how the WTO can react to this and how you can, uh, for the first time, put in numbers, put numbers and put uh, a little bit of pressure on the beggars agreement, all the big countries and see, look, we need WTO again, because again, we are, you cannot, you are violating the rules if you not uh, take care and uh, do not take, pay attention on countries that are not being included. If these emerging countries you, uh, you, uh, uh, you be affected, you can measure for the other countries that, um, that are not emerging countries, 
but certainly they can be affected by this, this uh, uh, mega agreements. So it's not true only that uh, you are creating diff three different fabrics, you are creating three different systems of trade. That's the point. The United States, the European Union, and the, 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 the China, they have different systems of investment, different systems of TBT and SPS, different systems of competition, and so on. So the reality is that they are not only mega, megas, they are uh, also really um, big, uh, uh, three different systems of freight. And this is the concern of the WTO setup. So that's it, uh, Fernando. I got it. I finished. So you can you can put uh, the start the discussion with the our uh, with Cicero. Please, can you help me to to not to join to, to close this? I have no idea how to do it. How you close? We this? just have to, to put it on ending the the sharing. Ah, I got it. Sorry. Okay. I hate the system, this platform. Great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very, very much. And uh, let's begin uh, our discussions, our debate. Uh, the people that are connected to us by WebEx can send their questions, their comments by the, the chat too. And uh, I've been selecting and, 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 and trying to organize the questions to pass them to our panelists. And then I pass the floor to Cicero Zanetti de Lima, researcher at Getulio Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo, to make his comments. Cicero, go on. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh... Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is a this is the the first question that we usually do in these uh, times in these all these uh, remote meetings. So and um, uh, first of all, I would like to say thank for the invitation, and it's a pleasure as a younger researcher to share this uh, virtual web, uh, seminar uh, with a lot of. Uh, 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 high uh, profile researchers that we in a, as a as a, um, a, a PhD student we just read in papers and books and now we, we are sharing the same rooms this is a pleasure so uh, and also uh, I was reading this uh, these papers and also I'm working with Professor Vera and um, there is a, let me just uh, do some introduction here uh, just one minute two minutes. Uh, there is a common expression in uh, financial international markets, that's the FOMO, that's the feeling of missing out when you are uh, decide about to do a, a kind of investment. And in the other day, you look at the, the stock market and your stock uh, just pump it a lot and you are missing out the, this. Uh, and when I, uh, when I, we usually do this uh, uh, kind of uh, trade policy analysis, uh, the feeling is the same, but just change the, the first letter is the cost of missing out. So the cost of uh, stay out of this agreement and stay out of the international trade market. So, um, and also uh, we know that uh, the COVID-19, uh, lo a lot of uh, different lockdown policies have caused a disruption in supply chains and also economic recession and also uh, increased uh, social disruption and also the inequality around the world especially for the um, for the for the most poor the, the poorest countries in the world this this time these two uh, years increase a lot of the pressure uh, over the over the food markets and also uh, in the beginning of the pandemic you guys know that a lot of countries changed their uh, short run trade policies to fear of the how the, the pandemic will uh, will be developed around the world and also these uh, different uh, trade measures closing the all the the international international market for uh, uh, food markets or for 
uh, medical stuff and all different kinds of uh, imports and ex exports. And this uh, also this period highlighted the importance of uh, the international trading food products and how and how this is essential for the economic development and food security, especially for the poorest countries around the world. So, and I think that when we bring this all these issues together, Brazil is in the middle of them. And now this is it's so important to to understand how uh, Brazil should. Uh, play in this international game as a a, a player in the uh, in the global agriculture producer and exports and also in the other types of industry as uh, Lucas has mentioned about the technology and also this connection with China, uh, U.S., European Union, and also uh, other important issue is how to how to increase the the um the trade basis to another with another another countries and another region so i think this this uh this time um uh, um uh, this all these issues emerge in these last two years how it's important to uh, increase this uh, trade basis and and also uh when we run uh this uh, kind of trade simulations and policy analysis, one common point when, when we are simulating the, the kind of agreement with Brazil and a, a, a rich count or developed country like Canada or US or European Union, you can see uh, an increase in the return of payments for capital, sorry, for land and a decrease in the uh, payments for capital and labor. And when you uh, uh, when you run the same scenario, but for example with Central America or other uh, middle-income countries or poorest countries, Brazil changed the the returns of payments. So this is uh, this is a, a a sign of the that a different different types of agreements are making pressure in our economy for natural resources, labor market, and so on. So this is super important. And okay, this is just uh, my uh, general comments. And also I have uh, just uh, some specific comments for the uh, presenters. So I have just, uh, I have one question for Wesley. So uh, when, you guys modeling this agreement, this trade, uh, this trade agreement, and you are uh, considering U.S. and European Union in a in one region. So, have you guys tried to separate and try to investigate the leakage effect when you are not considering like these huge players in international markets as a, a one single region or in an aggregated region? Because my feeling is that. Uh, you may have some uh, leakage effects in uh, in direction of the rest of the world region when we are considering China, uh, European Union, and US in these regions. It's just like a, a, a technical question. I don't know if I I do my questions and or. Answer now, to, 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 to answer it. Yeah, I, I can answer now if you want. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, you're right about that because uh, United States and uh, China, for example, are huge players in international trade. So uh, what we did was to put these regions together in, in the rest of the world. So we don't have the, the results of, uh, of these two regions uh, disaggregated. So. But you're right about this potential linkage in international trade that these two regions uh, have. Uh, uh, we, we, did, we didn't think about this when we when was when we uh, was choosing the the uh, regional structure of the models, uh, but uh, maybe we we can change the models to. 
to to capture the the effect the, the effects of this two regions in international in fact uh, some of the, the 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 models china is considered but not the united states but the united states is the main player in international trade so your comment makes a lot of sense i don't know what fernando think about this because we discussed the the, the regional structure when uh, when was when was when we work uh constructed the models but uh made maybe uh united states plays a, a, a important role uh for example in the, in the brazilian uh trade uh, maybe the results on brazilian gdp maybe export imports may change may change yeah. I don't, oh, know, but, but, but I, would, I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe this is a, a, a test that we can uh, make. Well, Fernando, uh, if you allow me, yeah. Fernando, look, uh, okay. this is a look, excellent opportunity for us, for uh, Wesley and uh, Cicero and uh, and uh, Victor is uh, uh, listen to it because he's the one in charge of the modeling to see. The, the ways we can go further, right, Wesley? That is, we are, we reach this is a, uh, I love the numbers of the IPEA, the results of IPEA, because they show the direction. So the point here is where we can go further, right? So this is more or less the idea that I asked Cicero to, to, to tell us what, where we can improve. Uh, certainly, uh, Lucas Ferraz uh, uh, give an important point that is, let us introduce the European Union and the Mercosur agreement here and see if this can balance the, the costs of Brazil being isolated. Perhaps not, perhaps yes. So a, a, a next step for, for the, our, uh, our uh, uh, work. And I love the, what the IPEA did with Africa because I did not work with Africa. And uh, and this is a thing that can affect us also, right? So this is the, the funny, uh, the beauty of working with uh, JETAP with different models and, and different uh, uh, hypotheses to see the difference and see where is the where is the the meat, right? Yes. Good. Yes, and I can and I can uh, I can say that uh, one thing that's very important and makes a huge difference is the way you model the NTX. Uh, I think this, this is crucial for, for the results. Uh, I think the, the, the bulk of the difference in the results, especially uh, when modeling RSEP, comes from the way uh, Wesley and Ajmir uh, model the, the, the shock on NTMs uh, that comes from the uh, ad valorem equivalent estimates from the World Bank. And, and Vito and you use uh, a different measure that's smaller, uh, a smaller gain of efficiency, and so this makes a huge difference. And so I think it's uh, one thing that can be better explored and better uh, discussed to, to make a, a, a better assessment of this effect that in some sense is, is, is more important than the tariff effect directly. And another thing uh, is to take account of the trade diversion effect. For example, I would like to see, uh, it was not the focus of the study, so we didn't consider that, but uh, I would like to see if uh, the trade uh, between Brazil and United States, United States would increase because of these agreements uh, with the United States out of the TPP, if there will be uh, an increase or not. So, uh, for where would be the trade diversion for Brazil? We would import less from the countries of our CEP or CTTP, for example, but where, uh, from where would we uh, import more? probably from the United States and other countries that not part, but it would be interesting to, to see that. So that we have many 
possibilities. Um, uh, I don't know if Cicero wants to, to, to make another question, isn't it? Yes, yes, thank you. So, yeah, uh, I, co I completely agree with you guys. So, and also uh, the, other, the other thing that came in my mind, so was about the service. So every time that we run these simulations, when we add service, the results change a lot. So, uh, because for example, in Brazil, 60% of our economy is service. So, and uh, we should control this in our simulation. So this is a, a, a two questions. It's a technical question for the, for Professor Vera and also for Wesley. Uh, so uh, did you guys control the, the service in, in your simulations or uh, this, the effects on service is a leakage of the international, the, the, the international trade agreement. And also, uh, is, uh, the second question is the point of a regulatory, because, uh, uh, in 20 years, or maybe less in 10 or 15 years, the, uh, I think that the service will change the game in the, in the, in the international trade, because we have uh, new kinds of technology, like the 5G for the internet for the net for the network connection worldwide and also uh, the social media uh, so like this kind of games international games and virtual spaces that they are crossing the borders creating a new markets new kinds of services and also the um, uh, of course the inter intelligent the artificial intelligence this will be like a a, a super important uh, point for, in my opinion, for Brazil. So, how we can uh, control all these effects in our simulations, especially when we are considering services? What do you think, guys? Uh, uh, I would I can go first, Vera. Say Vera. <laughs> okay, uh, I would like Vera, you can, you can talk, please. Look, service, I fully, fully agree with Cicero. A, a service is saying, oh, uh, we are doing a lot of uh, modeling. And when we introduce service, it's amazing the impact uh, uh, of service and the results. What it did is a kind of blend uh, of what CFI uh, is doing and uh, using a little bit of the restricted index of OECD. But again, is a, is a, is just a way of modeling things. That is, you know, there is a, a, a huge uh, material on the uh, uh, service restriction index in the OECD, and uh, the the CFI results for for service. So I'm really curious to know what how uh, Wesley is doing in the modeling service because this is a thing that we can can do and improve together. Uh, 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 since you are doing the, this exercise, uh, trying to compare and get some results from it. So Wesley, decide, tell us when, what to do. Yeah, we decided to aggregate uh, service in some some five or six or or. or <laughs> Or something like that. Uh, but what what we can see here is that uh, service is the, is the uh, is increasing this participation in global chain values. Uh, uh, studies uh, conducting by using uh, input output matrices is showing this. Uh, for example. Uh, uh, the participation of exports of Brazil. E, uh, of uh, 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 several sectors is about 16, 18 percent. But when you look at the, the, the participation of, of, of several sectors, uh, it's, in export is like 16, 17, 18 percent. But when you look at this participation in gross in, in, in GDP, it's much higher. So these sectors uh, is uh, integrated e each year after year. So I, I think this explanation. I think that I think this explanation is something like that. I think that this this several sectors is increasing the, the integration economy. Fernando, as as far as, say, know, as, far as I know, look uh, next year, Wesley, we are going to to have to 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 remake all the, the calculations again. As far as I know, 
GTAP is uh, releasing a new uh, database on uh, the numbers for the old. Can you imagine for the, the and they are doing as uh, I remember Victor uh, telling me that for the sector area, they are going to present for the first time um, a, a new database for service. And this will be nice. So, we are, we are, uh, Wesley, you are going to, to have to remake all these numbers, but this is the, 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 the what we, we enjoy doing research. It's not me, it's oh. Victor that is doing all this, the calculation. I'm a person who's trying to see the impacts of this, but I I learn a lot working with him, and uh, and I think that uh, uh, this would be a big difference, right? To to bring this um, this new uh, data back to the to the calculations. Right? Right. And, this would uh, be I, I think, fine. Uh, I think the integration uh, in service sectors are increased uh, not not only in Brazil, but in, in other cult in other cultures as well, uh, I think this is not a phenomenon uh, for Brazil. I think this is a general phenomenon. Uh, for Brazil, is is suspected the primary sectors, extractive sectors, uh, uh, outstanding, but uh, several sectors is not expected. But this is a a global phenomenon. Uh, I think Marina wants to talk something about the service. Marina. No, no, no Fernando, thank you. Actually, um, I had the same doubt that Cicero did. Uh, the, the, uh, asked about the, this, the modeling on services because it seems to me that uh, CPTPP has a very service central rule basis and, and, and we are not sure yet what is the outcome of those rules when it comes to services and the impacts that come from from it so i'm i'm glad he asked the question i i heard the answers i have another question but i can wait and see if there's time then I, I, and if you you think it's okay i can ask it okay we have a question from our colleague from ipea renato bauman uh, his question is this way uh, adhering to a mega agreement might imply an additional effect on participating in a value chain that might boost exports. How can the simulation models capture this at all? So, uh, and and I, I add I, uh, I add a, a personal question about that that we saw in the uh, recent years that. The global value chains lost steam. Uh, the organization, the construction of all global value chains lost steam in the the world trade. Uh, and and I ask for uh, all of you if you think that with this magas we can have uh, a new round of uh, uh, deepening of global value chains of constru constructions of regional, probably regional value chains and how this would affect Brazil. And, and, and as Renato asks, how this could be taken into account in the simulations. I don't know if Vera wants to, to talk something about it. Renato, thank you for the, the question. Uh, uh, we, I think that is not included, and Cicero can help me, uh, and Wesley also. Uh, it's not as, as such included in the model, but I think that is reflected clearly, because if you are a part of a, a, a chain, certainly you have imports on the, uh, the, 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 your, your data, uh, you will reflect that you are buying components and so on. Uh, as far for the, the future, near future, uh, I just read an article of Baldwin, uh, Richard Bobby from the Geneva Institute say exactly this, that the, that, uh, the, the COVID probably you um, allow these three fabrics to go to the different, uh, different ways. And the, the, the costs of not, not having components, now you uh, give some incentives to people to uh, decentralize it. But again, this is a thing that we have to wait. Uh, and I have, I have, I heard about other, other, other groups saying the different directions. Say, look, the costs are so huge to uh, rebuild 
three different systems of for value change that we do not know how the, the uh, enterprises you react. And so you have the two different, uh, uh, it's too early to say uh, in which difference uh, we are going to move. To, to. Uh, I think that uh, using GetApp, you can uh, project some results that uh, you can start to answer uh, this question. I don't know if it, if this exactly uh, question will be uh, respond, but we can think about some exercise that uh, we can uh, think about uh, considering this this kind of question. For example, uh, if it, if if we we simulate a one percent increase in one region. Uh, in one sector, in one region, so we can see what happened in the system. And then you can continue make simula simulations like that. Uh, you, you can see uh, how this, this kind of shock uh, uh, goes to uh, in, in change to, to, uh, in, into the, 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 the model. This uh, we can see the uh, uh, results uh, in terms of that. I don't know if, if this kind of exercise responds completely to this question, but we can we can think about this uh, this strategy, for example. So uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> with results uh, achieved with with this kind of exercises, we can think about uh, calculate another. Uh, indicator, uh, other uh, integrated integration indicator, uh, such as indicators uh, uh, calculated by uh, techniques of uh, input output methodology. For example. Okay. Thank you, Wesley. Uh, I have uh, uh, another question, and maybe uh, Marcos and Marina would like to to talk something about that. That uh, in, in in a sense, we can think that the these mega agreements can make the problem of definition of standards and technical requirements more complex, more complex than it's today. Because we have a technological war that's running, and we have a problem of. of uh, convergence and coherence uh, concerning the regulations and special the standards and you have different standards for United States for European Union for China and even for Brazil uh, and in which sense uh, we can see the mega agreements uh, turning this uh, this problem more complex or if they can uh, contribute to uh, to make it easier uh or to to define more uh, uh comprehensive standards that can be uh that can be held by uh, many countries including countries outside the agreements fernando for me this is the issue the issue if you are going to have three different hubs of uh uh of trade, not blocks, because I, I read uh, a very nice article saying that you're going to have three networks with the core, the United States, European Union, and China, and then you have the other, the more or less, uh, uh, the free flow of uh, uh, more or less of trade. But you, uh, I perfectly agree with you. TBT is called, it's a different word. You know that European Union loves the ISO uh, standards that has, to use it as a basis. The United States prefer to use their own market-oriented system. So complete, completely different. China normally used to go, depends on of, to where China is exporting. China says it to be, depends on the markets that you are export, right? But if you go to the digital uh, goods now, certainly China will have uh, their own, uh, 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 its own standard. And then you are going to see uh, if you are going to, to, to if it will be possible 
to develop these value chains that uh, Bauman said. Because if you're, you are going to have three different uh, sets of uh, standards on TBT, SPS, look, investment competition, so on, uh, the word would be, we need the WTO again to put a, some kind of order. Uh, at the end, I, what I'm really afraid of is having three different systems of uh, trade without a supervisor, without uh, an organization that can put a little bit of uh, order in the system. That's the point of the whole yeah. this exercise. It's an important Another. point, Marina. Marcos, do you want to go first or can I can I, I can, jump in? I can go first. Uh, just uh, some uh, ideas. I, I believe that um, uh, this uh, this is this is the core of uh, the existence of three independent and non-convergence of intentionally uh, systems. Uh, this is uh, this is the the purpose of why these mega regional agreements are. Uh, or at least both, uh, uh, we, we're still, we'll still uh, buy by the, the three in terms of our projects, but we we'll talk about the reset and uh, TPP. Uh, the logic behind these uh, two huge systems uh, is uh, the idea of creating uh, specific uh, uh, regulati regulatory systems to create uh, uh, regulatory discrimination and to create regulatory preferences to create global uh, regional value chains. So this is how we have a, 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 a regulatory construction to, to build on frameworks to create. If you are in, you play these rules and it will, it, it will not make things easier uh, like Fernando uh, uh, assumes as an idea that will it make it easier to uh, uh, comply with uh, TBT depends on which or well, which uh, set of rules are you dealing with and you want to establish yourself. This will be strategic for Brazil in terms of uh, will I build on uh, my my platform uh, to uh, uh, comply with the, the technical barriers uh, established by uh, TPP or by RECEP. It won't be the same. It will be different logics. So this is uh, this is uh, 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 will be a, a very interesting turning point. We're still uh, uh, reading this, no, Marina, uh, through uh, literature in terms of uh, revision of uh, uh, academic literature. We're, we're not in the um, the technical comparison of these rules yet, but it's it's a, it's a, it's a huge uh, matter to to deal with uh, during the next uh, the following steps of, the, of our project. Uh, this was the first uh, first uh, in, uh, insights, Marina. I'm sorry. Please continue. No, no, thank you. Actually, I am going to be the different one because, to be really honest, and allow me, Vera, just for a second to make a reflection here. Um, there, they are different systems, but when you look at the CPTPP and the RCEP, uh, they both go into. Uh, regulatory convergency, and they look to international standards. Uh, and RCEP is not so deep. Is RCEP does not go into that direction because RCEP is really focused on market access. Uh, so, so for for example, when you talked about e-commerce, you don't have the level of deepness in e-commerce in the in the RCEP that you have in CPTPP. Uh, and by saying that, what I want to I want to call the attention to is that. For the fact that not necessarily they are going to be different, I believe they could co they could they could have some convergence. And I am reading papers where we see in the future a, a, a possible merger between those two agreements, especially because they are not so different in where, in what they coincide. And and there are things that CPTPP are ruling that it's not within the RCEP and for this reason is not going to be so different or uh, or a different system so to speak i'm not talking about the european union because i think that's a, a different a different environment uh, but when you look at uh, antitrust and competition rules and investment rules uh, you have um, things that are very similar within the chapter if you take ip the ip chapter from both agreements they have huge similarities. So uh, 
coming back and I'm going to conclude, Fernando, when we look at the regional value chains, if Brazil wants to export to China and to Japan, or and if it looks to both agreements, maybe uh, the rules are going to be the same. And if he reached those rules in terms of services, or he is going to open those markets um, uh, for its uh, production chain. Uh, but of course, maybe it's not feasible for us. Maybe we can re cannot reach those standards because we are still one step behind. But that doesn't relate to the system per se, per se. that relates to our level of development. So I think uh, from the papers I've read till now, the behind the border measures should be seen as, in, as a, a, a stimulus of those agreements for us to try to cope and to, to, to settle us the same level of standard. It obviously calls the WTO to put an order on that because it's so important that they pay attention to it, but I'm not so sure they are going to be as antagonic as, 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 as it seems. Anina, you are completely right because R RCEP and TPP, they did the model are the United States model. The problem is between the United States and the European Union. And this is the point. That's the point. You got it. Now, let me just one minute to present to all of you Vitor Vieira. Come on, he's the boy who makes all this, the, the, the calculation. So, Vitor, here is Wesley and uh, uh, Fernando. So, we are, I hope that we can get some time after this event to discuss the, the, the little niceties of service and TV and uh, and TVs and all this awful stuff that you the top boys love to do. So I think that now we can put all together. There's a lot of questions about service on on and peace and all this. So I think that and uh Fernando, I think that you are going to 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 to, to have another to plan another seminar to discuss uh the next step of your work. If I say that is enough, well, you are. You Surely, are, I, I just. I just want to ask if you want to, uh, to talk something about the, this team, this study, one, two minutes uh, about this, about the, this, the efforts. And say that is, uh, uh, we must work together. We can work together to to consider another ways of modeling the effects. Uh, maybe modeling uh, uh, the possibility of Brazil entering the CPP. What are the benefits of entering the RCEP? So we have many different kinds of. Uh, ways uh, and possibilities to model this. Vito, if you want to say something, we are just ending the event, but Perfect. we would like to hear something from you. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, everybody. First of all, my apologies. I had a meeting that I could not uh, reschedule, so my apologies. And uh, definitely, I think it is a, a work that we can uh, not just improve the kind of the methodology that we used, uh, but also to uh, improve, uh, including other agreements and see, for example, how the agreement with European Union could mitigate the negative impacts on the study that we have. Uh, another example is we used the TP12, but maybe United States will not come back, so we can also do a study uh, as the pair did using this PTPP. So definitely, I think it's a work that we uh, had a lot of a lot of things to do to improve. But I think the message is very clear that we need to uh, improve uh, as we are doing, as Lucas are doing. Uh, with an excellent job uh, looking for uh, bilateral agreements or multilateral agreements. Uh, because I think the results shows that uh, a message very clear. We cannot continue isolated. We need to uh, look for uh, strategic partners because uh, as we saw in, in the results, uh, we are going to face a huge trade diversion, mainly for Brazil with the strategic partners like Japan, South Korea, US and others. Uh, so uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you again, Fernando, uh, to invite us and the Professor Vera. My apologies again. 
And for sure, I think we have a lot of things to discuss about uh, this work. Thank you. Okay, Vito, thank you. Uh, congratulations for the work. It's very good. And uh, after finishing the event, say that we have a, a, a large uh, agenda of works uh, concerning modeling the, the effects using uh, GTAP and even other uh, computer generic linear models. We're working uh, very uh, next to people at uh, Foreign Trade Secretariat and with Lucas and uh, his people. And it, uh, we would be glad to work together with you. And I, uh, again, uh, call attention for that the two studies uh, that IPEA, that were presented by IPEA, the Wesleyan study and the study by Marina Marcos, uh, will be published in our bulletin of international political economy. Uh, and so uh, probably at the end of the year, it will be available at IPEA's uh, website. And the work by uh, Vera and Vitor will be available at uh, the Tuli Vargas Foundation website as a discussion paper, isn't it? And uh, for finish, I would like to, to pass again uh, the floor for Mr. Vera Zut to, to make his final remarks. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for the participation, for being with us until now. And it's a pleasure for IPEA to have uh, the WTO Chess program uh, joining us and participating with us. Well, thank you very much, but I wasn't really planning on taking the floor another time. I was not also planning uh, to, to attend the whole seminar because I uh, have, have to do other work but I was so fascinated with your presentations and I found the slides and the, and the discussion among the, the professors really very inspiring. I, I congratulate you to the research you've done on the various mega regionals and uh, I can only um, say I'm impressed with the work you've done so far. There are lots of questions I would like to ask, but not today. It's getting late in Geneva, but I, I, pre I, I really, um, was captivated by your discussion and I, I'm, I'm very impressed and thank you very much for what you've achieved. Okay, Mr. Zuk, thank you very much. Um, well, our director, Ivan Oliveira, had to, to go out. He had uh, uh, something at five o'clock and had to go, but uh, in the name of IPEA, uh, in the name of the International Economic and Political Relations uh, Department of IPEA, I thank uh, all the panelists. I thank Wesley Faria and his colleague, Admir Betarelli, that worked together with him in this, uh, in this paper. I thank Marina and Marcus for their presentation. I thank Vera, Tortison, uh, and Vitor Vieira for their excellent paper. I thank uh, Cicero Zanetti for his comments. And I thank all the people that uh, joined us and stayed with us until now, until the end. And IPE is very glad, very, uh, very happy to, to organize this kind of event. And Thank you all and hope see you soon in another event. And Vera, let's work together, let's model, <laughs> let's make more, more different hypotheses, more results to, to understand uh, the, uh, as, as better as you can uh, the impacts of this trade agreement for the Brazilian economy. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you, Fernando.
Thank you all. Goodbye for all. Goodbye.